Welcome to Tech on Earth, a podcast aimed at bringing a practical lens to tech ethics around the world. I'm Elizabeth Ranieris, founding director of the Notre Dame IBM Technology Ethics Lab at the University of Notre Dame. Today, I am so pleased to be joined by the venerable Tenzin Priyadarshi, president and CEO of the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics and Transformative Values at MIT. So I'd like to begin with your journey to this conversation. Could you tell us how a Buddhist monk ends up running an ethics lab at MIT? Well, thank you. It's a delight to be here. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the sort of aspirations uh, of a Buddhist monk is, of course, contribute to both the uh, conversations and doing of better world, uh, a world where people are more kind, empathetic, and compassionate, and a world where people are more concerned about aspects of ethical framing and justice. And so MIT was, in many ways, a natural home for such a uh, platform and such a conversation. So the title of your lab references what you call transformative values. I'm interested, what are transformative values and how might they relate to a conversation about AI or technology ethics? I think one of the, one of the challenges with sort of a, a traditional understanding of ethics is that it has largely been theoretical. Uh, it has also largely been, um, at least in academia and certain settings, more of, you know, the uh, the history of ethics or the sociology of ethics, the philosophy of ethics and things of that nature. So one of the things that we aspired to do with the center was to make the conversation more relevant um, uh, to the ideas of leadership, to the ideas of innovation uh, and so on. And so transformative values was simply a framework to invite individuals to actually think of, you know, both ethical imagination and values framing in practical terms uh, that primes their day-to-day decision-making and their outlook of the world. Sounds like there are a lot of synergies between <laughs> our labs and our missions. Um, as you know, our lab is also very much focused on bringing a, a practical and applied lens to things. For purposes of this conversation, for those who aren't familiar, I was hoping you might also give us a brief introduction, appreciating this is a large body of work, but into Buddhist ethics and how, in your mind, they relate to AI or technology ethics more broadly. And of course, we'll dive into more specific examples in in a few minutes. I think what the Buddhist ethics does is, is, is simply sort of set aspirations and goals, both for individuals and for communities at large, in terms of how to create a fabric, a social fabric that allows for flourishing and well-being of majority of its members. Uh, So it's not just the idea that, oh, the world should be or ought to be in a certain way, but it also begs the question of what should individuals be doing in that role and and how should individuals contribute to to such a setting. The other thing is in, in, in the framing of Buddhist ethics is that it's not just a normative approach. Uh, It's a very didactic, reflective approach to things um, uh, in terms of its process. So the idea is not that, you know, uh, let's just abide by certain rules and regulations that is created by a certain group of people, but sort of an ongoing healthy conversation about uh, what ethical imagination is. Uh, Again, you know, reminding us of the fact of the complexity of the world that we live in, that not everything that is legal may be ethical. Well said. Could you maybe break it down a little further and, and give us, I don't know, one or two practical examples of a, val- a key value uh, in Buddhist ethics that's, that in, in your mind is relevant in this conversation? I think, uh, you know, uh, one of the thing is, uh, you know, with regards to, for example, technology, you know, one of the challenges is that to be cautious of the narratives and the storytelling. So so, uh, Buddhist discipline is very emphatic on the idea of checking your biases. Uh, It's very emphatic about the idea of how not to get into false storytelling or false narratives, uh, no matter how uh, attractive it may seem. 
And one of the things that we are encountering in, in the current landscape of, of technology is virtue signaling. Uh, we see a lot of virtue signaling happening from uh, you know, all walks of tech companies and so on. And so you know, just the reflective mechanism that, that sort of demands a kind of radical honesty on part of individuals and the companies to say, you know, are you really true to the narrative or are you simply weaving a narrative for public perception as opposed to the actual content of, of things? Uh, you know, the, the second thing could be uh, around the idea of how do we sort of frame uh, ethical aspirations in sort of innovation. So for example, you know, historically, when we look at ethics, uh, it has often been uh, a conversation around restraint, do not do this, don't do that, and, and so on. Or if you do this, you'll get punished. But uh, when you're looking at sort of partly in, in terms of how we frame Buddhist ethics, it has to do with a process of, you know, if we were to follow a certain kinds of guidelines, how could we nurture sort of well-being for the maximum amount of people participating in this process? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and well-being is really interesting. I think particularly at the time that we're having this conversation, right? We're on the heels of more than two years of a, a near virtual experience for many of us. We're on the cusp potentially of another world. Some are referring to as the metaverse. From a Buddhist standpoint, you know, what are for you some of the key lessons or values that are featuring most prominently in the role that technology is playing in our lives at this time, including from a well-being standpoint? I think I think it, it it again you know sort of begs the question of both the short and long term implications of technologies that we use. Uh, we haven't quite fathomed uh, the behavioral shifts uh, that happens in individuals, even with the usage of something that has almost become second nature to us in terms of our response to cell phones and cellular technology. That how uh, it has contributed to a sense of impatience. Uh, to a sense of urgency, to a sense of irritation, and mild irritations that have cumulative effect over a period of time. Uh, how it has, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of challenged our well-being by virtue of just sleep, uh, you know, uh, or lack thereof. I don't think uh, historically we have ever been such a sleep-deprived society. You know, so those are, you know, some of the questions that sort of highlights the, the emotional well-being of things, meaning that, you know, uh, despite of end number of means of bringing the world together virtually, uh, social isolation and loneliness uh, is, the, uh, is is becoming the new epidemic. So part of the, the Buddhist framing of things is the paradoxes are right in front of your eyes. Uh, look at it and, and uh, see if there's a resolution to that rather than sort of taking sides with a particular set of narratives. Great, thank you. I do want to turn to the more practical and applied uh, conversation, uh, as we noted earlier. Um, so let's examine how a Buddhist perspective might inform different technologies in practice. I know you've been a big proponent or advocate of something you call ethics by design. So maybe we start with what that means to you and whether you might give us a practical example. Sure. I think, you know, one of the sort of challenges, and, and, and I would say a, a rather sort of expensive thing for most companies was that, you know, when they would design products, they would simply design products with particular sort of data sets or efficiency quotient in mind. Uh, and then they would, you know, traditionally what they would do is they would run it through their compliance team uh, just to make sure that, you know, there were no legal loopholes. Then they will deploy the project. And then, you know, if something went wrong, they will try to fix it or, or, or try to find legal loopholes. And that has been the method with which we have been operating in the name of efficiency, in the name of scaling up certain kinds of technology and so on. But when we talk about, you know, certain kinds of technology, one of the key issues is that if we ramp up things so fast, the negative cost of it on our, on our society uh, is, is perhaps so expansive that it's difficult to get back. It, it's difficult to ram back, meaning you cannot really undo uh, uh, certain kinds of uh, deployments. And so part of my push was that why can't we have the conversation around ethical framing at the design stage, uh, meaning just rather than just having engineers in the room, having certain or, or, or marketing psychologists in the room, uh, why not also have certain kinds of individuals who can at least inform us 
creatively as to what could go wrong. And not only what could go wrong in legal sense of the things, but what could go wrong in terms of the social well-being, in, in terms of disruption of certain kinds of desirable behaviors and, and so on. And then at least it, it, it opens up the room for us to design better because we know and we are able to frame certain kinds of problems very early on, rather than waiting until stage one of deployment or stage two of deployment. Right. So moving from a sort of post hoc compliance mindset to a more proactive uh, ethical framework, um, you know, I, as a lawyer, I appreciate that that's a really different orientation. And I think a very important one to note in this conversation. I would also like to examine how this works in specific technologies or industries. So, for example, you know, I've, I've, uh, I'm familiar with some of your work around the automotive industry or self-driving cars or trucks. How would you apply the sort of Buddhist ethical framing to uh, that, that type of technology? So I, I think, you know, one of the one of the examples that I that I often give is, uh, again, in terms of the distinction between uh, legal and cultural framing of, of things. You know, one common example is around uh, how car algorithms can respond to, you know, certain unusual scenarios on the street. So, for example, if you were running a, a scenario in the U.S. and you said, you know, there's a car going at a certain velocity and it needs to swerve left or right in order to save, say, five lives, uh, because many of us do sort of lean towards those kinds of utilitarian calculations uh, when, when uh, uh, making such decisions. And let's say on the right side, you have a guy on a motorbike with a helmet on. On the left side, you have a guy without a helmet on. Uh, which way should the car swerve? You see, and in the US, most people would suggest that the car should swerve to the right because the guy on the right is wearing a helmet has extra protection. So in case the car hits the guy, at least the guy is protected. But in most sort of Asian contexts, uh, it raises, uh, you know, people would say, no, the car should swerve to the left because the guy wasn't following the rule to begin with. So why should we penalize the guy who was actually following the rule? So you see, it, it poses a certain kinds of challenges, both in terms of, you know, the cultural norms of what people expect, how uh, we should sort of program certain algorithms to make uh, certain kinds of decisions uh, versus not. And again, you know, it's it it would be you know we come into sort of similar kinds of scenarios as, as you probably are aware. Uh, for example, in Germany, uh, when uh, uh, the idea was given that the car should uh, you know hit somebody who's older in age, for example, because they have lived uh, much of their life as opposed to a pregnant woman or as opposed to a young kid. And it already sort of shows certain kinds of biases towards ageism and, and things of that nature. So when you sort of insert the Buddhist lens, it still says that you, know, you need to sort of respect life for the potential that it has rather than what the historicity of that life is. Uh, rather than what the person has actually done. Yeah, thank you. That's a really vivid example. And for me, it raises the question of whether that could ever be a, a rule-based or computational decision baked into code, right? It feels like there's a real qualitative contextual piece to this that perhaps can't be addressed so easily in, in something like code. Yes, yes. And, and you know, ultimately, it does sort of uh, raise the issue of moral agency, right? Uh, because, you know, most commoners, when, you, when, when they're thinking about, you know, self-driving cars, they're actually thinking of self-driving cars. They're thinking that they would not be responsible because they are not driving. They're just being in the car. But the issue still becomes, you know, is that who is ultimately responsible in case of a mishap? And that's, you know, we generally look at moral agency in cases of mishap. And so, you know, should it be the car company? Should it be the, uh, the algorithm writer? Should it be the software? Um, uh, should it be the sensors? Who do you hold responsible at the end of the day? Yeah, that's a great point as well. Um, I want to look at another example from this time from healthcare. So as you probably saw and noted, uh, as many of us did during the pandemic, um, we had an example out of Stanford where there was a question about an algorithm prioritizing vaccinations among certain healthcare workers. Increasingly, AI and other tools are being used to assign or allocate care, um, you know, things like prioritizing vaccinations, but other decisions as well. Again, how would you bring a, a Buddhist lens to that the question and, and that conversation? One of the things that, that the AI community has perhaps talked and over-talked is uh, the 
set of data on which the current algorithms are based on. And there is a wide acceptance that many of these data sets are uh, corrupt. Uh, many of these data sets are biased, whether it's come from, whether it is for healthcare or criminal justice system or whatnot. So I think first thing is an aspirational mode where we at least try to sort of quality control the data sets on which we are, we are building such things. The, the second thing is sort of, you know, actually thinking about a non-biased sense of approach to care. You know, we are increasingly entering into a territory where we are not only talking about gendered uh, notions of care or non-gendered notions of care, or who is, is, is sort of actually interfacing with the patients and so on. So one of the things with, with, the, with the AI sort of intervention is actually to see whether we are able to sort of create something that truly fosters the, this unbiased idea of providing care, uh, really sort of being agnostic in terms of who is in front of you. In, in, in certain ways, uh, but at the same time, being able to sort of recognize the context of the individual in, in making certain kinds of uh, recommendations. But the second stage of challenge still remains whether our physicians and healthcare workers are trained enough to follow those recommendations. Right. That's a, always an important consideration as well. Um, I've got one more case study or example for you, and then I do want to turn back to some of the more philosophical questions. So a topic that's coming up a lot now is in the defense industry around things like autonomous weapons or killer robots, as they're sometimes termed. Um, what is a Buddhist perspective on those developments? The whole idea of a killer robot is an oxymoron from Buddhist perspective in the sense that why would you actually design something that only adds to efficiency and, and, and creates kind of some kind of challenge around moral agency, uh, especially when taking lives. Uh, so one of, the, one of the things that we have to recognize that, that any time we discuss going into war or stopping war, one of the major factors besides budgetary constraints and things of that nature was lives lost. You see. Even a country like United States, when it would go into war, one of the major sort of uh, uh, data set looking was number of lives lost for US soldiers and so on. Uh, and so again, it, it, it becomes a matter of convenience when we transfer that kind of agency into killer robots. Uh, and you forget about the number of lives lost on the other side, the civilians and so on, because now this data set is no longer relevant uh, to us because it's just robots. Uh, so that's one of the key things uh, I think that we need to sort of be mindful of uh, that we may make the arguments that it would serve as a deterrent for many to engage in these things. But from a, a societal perspective, uh, it may actually create more readiness or more willingness for us to engage in war, especially with countries that do not have uh, uh, such means. Uh, and then of course, you know, the entire concern and fear of hacking those robots and who uses for what purposes, that's sort of another ball game. Thanks for taking on the case studies with me. I think, um, you know, given that we're both situated at universities that are going to produce a lot of the, the future leaders will be making some of the decisions around these technologies. Um, I want to get your view on education. So particularly the skills and disciplines that we should emphasize in, in preparing students to become ethical leaders as they go on to shape these tools and technologies. What's your perspective on what's needed there? I think we need to sort of seriously consider the role of ethical learning in, in university settings and not just university, but even sort of you know, in, in, in high school and other forms of tertiary education. Uh, I mean, that was one of the uh, aspirations with which the, which, with which the Center for Ethics was founded at MIT. Because if you looked at sort of a, a, a trajectory of education, unless and until you were a philosophy major, a declared philosophy major, uh, you never actually took ethics course, unless you went to sort of some of the religious universities where they might give you a little bit of education on traditional sort of religious role of ethics and, and so on. So I think it's, you know, one of the major challenges is, is that we provide all these different kinds of quote unquote relevant skill sets to individuals, but we don't actually provide them with the skill sets to engage in ethical decision making. 
uh, we don't actually provide them with the skill sets to actually factor in aspects of kindness, honesty, truthfulness, transparency, in how they look at the world and how they make uh, decisions. And we have sort of encountered that on a variety of levels, you know, the financial meltdown most recently in 2008, 2009. And uh, the issue with ethics board in certain kinds of tech companies, where the engineering mindset wants a blueprint. They're not sort of keen on looking at ethical explorations of, of how the world functions. Yeah, it's interesting. It's almost, we have a lot of emphasis on the ethics of AI or the, the ethics of technologies or ethics by design in technologies. But what you're talking about is really ethics, the ethics of the individual, the ethical decision-making of the individual, the uh, seems to be non-technology related qualities that then inform and shape the way the technologies ultimately develop. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, I'll tell you an incident like, uh, you know, without naming names, but like two years or three years ago, I was I was uh, uh, a fellow at Stanford. And one of the things I was trying to do is talk with a bunch of tech leaders around the area. And, you know, I, I, I raised a simple question in the room that what sort of technology or product design are you working on today that you are completely comfortable with your kids or grandkids using it? There wasn't a single product in the room. And it raises the issue where people are actually, you know, when you, per, when you sort of challenge them personally on, on some of these ideas, they reveal their discomfort. But as opposed to sort of, you know, working for any of the companies and designing certain things, it, it, it sort of, uh, you know, those things doesn't cross their mind. Uh, that actually they're designing it for masses in a in, 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 in certain way. So I, th- I think those are sort of key issues. And, and we have to recognize as educators that learning ethics is not magic. You know, learning ethics is not genetics, so to speak, that you will uh, have certain individuals who would wake up one day and become ethical all of a sudden. Uh, and it is the responsibility of, of educational institute, institutions to, to pay as much attention to ethical learning as much as we are paying attention to business leadership and tech leadership and designing products, either for consumer orientation or for military and so on. All great points that I strongly agree with. And I, I think, um, again, I think your lab is doing great work towards that end. I want to start to wrap up here by talking about another uh, prominent feature of our times, namely uncertainty. So we're speaking, you know, during a time of great uncertainty in every sense, um, from geopolitical uncertainty to uncertainty about how new and emerging technologies like AI will develop and unfold. Buddhism has a lot to say about uncertainty, right? So what can it teach us at this time and how might it help us navigate some of this uncertainty? I think what Buddhism is constantly reminding us is uncertainty is reality. All that I think recent events with pandemic and so on has done is perhaps increase our aperture to experience or accept that sense of uncertainty, not not so much even experience, but accept it in in certain ways. And so there are a bunch of sort of tools, I think, not just exclusive to Buddhism, but in terms of the contemplative mindset that allows us to both adapt and embrace uncertainty. And I think we'll be better as humans, we'll be better as a society, we'll be better as a civilization if we are able to sort of cultivate those tools uh, to embrace uncertainty and not try to sort of just uh, lean towards a fixated view of things. So Venerable Tenzin Priyadarshi, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. Likewise, thank you so much for having me.